Hi, everyone. Joining us today for episode two, season five of the Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Center in Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bolin, an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. It has been so much fun launching Season 5 of Revise and Resubmit, and we have got an exciting season ahead for you all. Ah, you know, you're right. And as we continue to roam the halls of Reese Pfeiffer, Paul, searching for faculty to interview. <laughs> We don't have to roam that far to find some really cool people to chat with. And today we are talking to a person who knows about lights and cameras and bears. Bears! And I'm going to keep you guessing for just a moment on that before we dive in uh, with our guests. But as always, I have a question for you, Kim. And that question is, what is your best animal encounter? Most unexpected, most cuddly, biggest, smallest. And I don't mean like fruit fly. We all have fruit fly. <laughs> and before you answer, I'll give you a, like a moment to ponder that. Okay. I have to say that if I met an elephant in real life, that would be the best. Because like roll tight. <laughs> uh, but. I'm going to share my best, most recent animal encounter. So this summer, you and I both presented research at the International Communication Association in Paris. And it was lovely. Very lovely. I was, wa- so I was walking around Paris and before the conference and there's all these gardens around and I was walking around one of those and like around the bend, there were kangaroos. What? Kangaroos. And I was like, oh, a kangaroo. <laughs> Because you go to Paris to like eat the baguette and to see the Eiffel Tower. And and I did those things and I got to see a kangaroo and it was unexpected and it was wonderful. And like <laughs> 10 out of 10, go to the kangaroo garden in Paris. Okay. Best okay. encounter, go. Uh, I'm glad that you asked. I think it definitely has to do with our episode today. I did not, however, see a kangaroo in Paris. I don't know how I missed that. I feel like we were running the same blocks in the same parks, but I missed out on a wonderful animal encounter. I guess my answer is not a bear, unfortunately, but I do have many several camping stories where bears were perusing the campsite at night, but that wasn't my favorite encounter. I think my best encounter was actually underwater. I had just gotten certified to dive, and it was my first time diving in a place where the water was clear and the fish were abundant. And I saw all the fish that you see in pictures or in tanks, like all these little fishies. And they were swimming around, and it was just kind of magical because I wasn't that deep. And you you know, had this light coming in, and everything was kind of turquoise blue. And then you had these yellow and orange and green and red and blue fishies just all over. Um, now, to be fair, I had to like, remember to keep my mouth shut so there wasn't a drowning situation on our hands. Um, <laughs> but I actually think our next guest has an even better animal encounter story. And our next guest tells us about her dreams of working as a TV reporter as a young sixth grader and how it all played out after she finished her master's in broadcast journalism and her experiences as a professional journalist led her directly to the halls of Reese Pfeiffer as a scholar and a professor. So once again, what we're going to say after today's conversation is take a few minutes and just process and think about all she had to say about the journalistic workplace. Maybe even think about your own workplace. We cover so much territory in this episode. We want to thank you um, for joining us as we dive into episode two of season five with today's guest, Dr. Caitlin Miller, an assistant professor in the Department of Journalism and Creative Media. Welcome, Caitlin. Thank you so much for joining us today, Caitlin. We are thrilled to be able to catch up with you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we're going to start off with what we call our rapid fire questions. And these are very, very easy. Um, 
So tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you do now. Yeah, my name is Caitlin Miller. Um, I originally grew up in the Sacramento area of California, but I moved to Alabama by way of Oregon. Uh, I got my PhD at the University of Oregon. Uh, and now I study journalism at the University of Alabama as an assistant professor. All right. And almost just as important, how are your puppies this morning? <laughs> <laughs> they are great. I have two and we'll be babysitting a foster puppy here on Thursday, uh, but the two we have are good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Caitlin. So as a youngster, <laughs> what did you imagine that you would be doing as a grown up? Oh man, as a youngster, I wanted to be a TV reporter. Um, it was wow. the sixth grade. I was like, I want to be a TV reporter, which I ended up doing. So in the end, I let a sixth grader decide my future, if you think about Ooh. it. Um, but yeah, I love journalism. I loved speaking. And so I wanted to get into broadcast. And that is eventually what I did and then decided maybe that industry is not quite uh, what I wanted. And I kind of fell in love with research. And that's how I got to where I am now as an academic. But it was being a TV reporter that was the dream okay so we're gonna already start with follow-up questions usually we're like at least seven minutes in before I start with follow-up but tell us more about that working as a reporter and what it was like and, and all of that yeah, so my undergrad career, I studied mostly print, but I had always wanted to do broadcast and my institution just didn't have that. And so I ended up getting my back. In, in journalism, particularly on broadcast. Um, and I just loved it. Every day was different. You get to tell other people's stories. Um, you never know what it's going to bring. And so when I graduated with my master's, I got a job in Bozeman, Montana as a multimedia journalist. So I was like a daily on air um, TV journalist. And I covered everything from court cases to murders to <laughs> somebody picked up a baby bison in Yellowstone and put it in their car. Um, what? What? Because it looked cold, you know? <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not kidding and so it was just an experience I found myself on like two-seater airplanes little Cessnas flying over Yellowstone I found myself wow. you know as the police chief cried in front of me because he couldn't prevent a crime um, that oh, occurred oh and was goodness. devastating to the community and just like a, a plethora of stories and it was really fun and fascinating but it's ultimately a unique industry that has its ups and downs and um, that's why I decided to take a step back and now I get to help other people who want to join that industry um, and who love telling stories as much as me. But yeah, it was it was my dream job. And I did it. And I got to say I did it. And I followed through, <laughs> but I eventually moved on. <laughs> hey. And we have a we have a Montana connection. I was born and grew up a little bit in Montana as well. I don't I rarely run into people in Alabama. And they're like, Oh, yeah, I've been to Montana. I know where Montana is on the map. Or I've lived in lived and worked there. So super cool. Yeah, Montana, I used to say, is one of the most beautiful places I will ever live. I mean, yeah. it was it was gorgeous. There's yeah. so much to do and see. Um, it, it was fun. And Bozeman was a unique town because it had, you know, this R1 university in a town with a population of 40,000. Um, and, <laughs> and so there was always something going on because Yellowstone was also so close. And it was, it's fun. It's a fun place for sure. So you said, and, and I'm going to... Uh... I, th I feel like I'm going to put this on a billboard. You said, I fell in love with research. <laughs> what is it that you research? Um, yeah, wonderful segue. I actually, instead of somebody who does journalism, now I get to study journalists. And so I actually research journalistic processes and routines and the work they do. And so I look less at their content, but now I get to study the experience journalists have as they're, as they're going through the process of creating that content and what factors may or may not kind of influence the work they do. One of the main factors I look at um, is harassment. So I've been called the harassment person but I think in a positive way, um, <laughs> hopefully, um, because I, you know, like to talk to journalists about things that influence them and that they feel maybe people aren't talking about. And it's so important, kind of as the political climate changes and we're looking at the way um, people think about news now, it's quite different than maybe they did 10, 20 years ago. And that is having an effect on journalists and the way they operate and the way they do their work as well. Um, and overall, the harassment they receive, both inside the newsroom, but particularly outside. So that's a lot of the research I do. Okay, so back us up just a little bit and talk to us about one of your earlier studies and maybe what you found 
and then kind of walk us through the evolution of what you're doing now and maybe how what you're studying has changed or what you've learned and found through your studies has changed. Yeah, I think when you first start out as a scholar, you're on this mission to kind of find yourself and what's that thing you want to do and what interests you. And so I, I have studies that look at photo journalists and how they make ethical decisions. And I have a study where I just looked at how journalists use Twitter as a source. Um, I have you know studies where I look at how Sinclair broadcast uh, news organizations produce news and if it has slant, whatnot. Um, but ultimately, kind of one of the early on harassment is what really got me excited because, you know, and back to the personal, I was a TV reporter. I was a woman, 23 years old, out with a camera by myself all the time, Mm -hmm. day and night. Um, And I experienced harassment and abuse and hostility myself. And so it's something for which I was quite interested in. And so this early study I looked at with my co-author, women in broadcast journalism and the harassment they experience while out in the field. Um, and so I'm not talking about harassment that happens in the newsroom, which is also a prevalent and pressing issue, but has been studied. I wanted to understand the harassment that happened in the field. And so we spoke to um, well over 20 women journalists, a lot of them multimedia journalists, just like I was about their experiences. And we found out that women face harassment online in a person quite often and it does impact them and they have to kind of instill these emotional responses because they're mm-hmm. dealing with a lot of emotional labor labor that many of their men colleagues don't have to deal with and so that paper came out and has been really well received um, a lot of people have been interested in this idea of wow journalists do have emotions right and it is it does <laughs> affect the way they do their work they're not just these flies on the wall and so from there I really wanted to understand more about this. I don't want to look at just women now. I want to look at men and women and are there differences? And so my research has evolved looking at print journalists as well, men journalists as well, really diving into journalists of color. And what I'm finding is future research that um, I've had published, one that just published last fall, looked at kind of the intersectional nature of hostility. And I argue, you know, we think of intersectionality as just like race and gender. Um, A black woman is gonna have a very different experience from a white man, right? Because she's got two different intersecting um, identities of oppression, that of her gender, right? And that of her racial background. Um, And so we're seeing that that is the case for sure. But what I also argue is that being a journalist, that is also an identity of oppression because being a journalist opens you up to an element of hostility that you wouldn't have had had you been in a different type of profession. And so we're seeing multiple intersections of oppression and identities as they come forward because yes, white men journalists are still getting harassed, right? Because they're still journalists. And so I make this argument and build on this kind of theoretical foundation in some research I've published looking at these differences um, in either gender or I've got a paper I'm working on with a grad student looking at um, just journalists of color, specifically black journalists and their experiences with harassment while covering Black Lives Matter protests. Mm -hmm. Um, And so trying to understand these intersecting identities is really how my research has evolved because there's so much to it. Um, And there's so many other identities we haven't even had an opportunity to explore yet. Um, I also haven't done much research looking at public radio, but we're seeing an exodus of journalists of color from public radio stations across the country why is that and so that's another area that needs some Uh further examination so i guess what i'm hearing is don't be a journalist because (laughs) (laughs) um it's tough and you might have to deal with harassment and then your own emotions um so how do you how do you um how do you communicate like get ready like you might feel some of these things and experience some of these things when you're teaching? Like, does your research enter the classroom? Yes. And this is a wonderful question because this is what gets asked of me all the time. I was just at a conference um, in Detroit earlier this month and this question was asked of me and it's like, well, what about, what do we do to students in the classroom, especially when we're looking (laughs) at a professional who left the industry? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great, it's a great question. I, in, in one of the many interviews I've done with journalists, I had this woman tell me about times where she had been hit, slapped, punched, spit on, yelled at, um, had a weapon pointed at her. And she says, call me crazy, but I don't want to do anything else. Wow. Wow. And 
and it, it comes back to this idea of, I mean, we see nurses are abused and, and mistreated and harassed all the time, but they do it because they care and they believe in the profession. And that kind of aspirational work is what we see in journalism. Um, this belief that journalism matters and I'm telling other people's stories and voices that are otherwise silenced. And I believe in it as an institution. So despite for some people, the low pay, the hours, the holidays that you work, and sometimes even the abuse, I don't want to do anything else. Mm. And so as a professor, my goal is to prepare students for this reality. I don't ever want a student to get into the newsroom and say, I had no idea this is what it would be like. Yeah. Um, I, I had a friend of mine say, they don't teach you this in journalism school. And that breaks my heart because they should. And mm -hmm. so I try to prepare students for the reality. Um, this is what it's going to look like for you. And this is how to be proactive in taking care of yourself and keeping yourself safe. And most importantly, how to advocate for yourself when you're that young 22 year old in a newsroom. Um, trying to, you know, prove you've got what it takes, um, but how to still advocate for your safety and your mental and physical health. Um, so it's a tough line to cross, but I think for so many, it is really worth it to them. So I want to shift gears a little bit, but I think it ties into everything that you just said. You've done all this research looking at journalists in different areas. You've looked at it by demographics. And so what I'm wondering is, from an academic side, theoretically, methodologically, you're clearly making contributions to the discipline. But I also feel like there have to be outcomes that are more applied, like ways to inform the practice. So is that something that you do as well in your work? Yes, definitely. And I think that's so important not just in the genre of work I do around hostility and harassment, but just in journalism studies generally, is answering that so what in an applicable way. I always try to tell you, okay, here's the gap I'm filling in research, but how can I make changes practically to the newsroom? And yes, there are huge implications. Um, my research and the research of other scholars out there has shown that by and large management has been pretty slow to respond to the reality of harassment that journalists face. Wow. And so, for example, I have a paper under review right now with my co one of my co-authors, Jake Nelson, um, and we talk about some of these larger structural changes that newsrooms can do to help decrease what is called dark participation, quant coined the term, um, and it's basically participation with audiences online that turns dark, where journalists end up experiencing kind of harassment and hostility in these online settings when when talking to audiences. So how can news organizations better adjust to this reality? And we talk about structural changes where we need to see more diversity in the newsroom, right? We need to see voices of more women and journalists of color and immigrants in leadership roles because the empathy that they're gonna have for these situations and the different experiences of the journalists who are actually out in the field reporting is gonna be quite different than maybe a man who, a man who is white, right? And so we're looking for larger structural changes that are more diverse, but then also, changes that can kind of happen at the micro level. When a journalist comes to you and say, this was my experience, don't go, yep, that's part of the job and move on, but actually file a report either with police or with HR or how to move forward so that journalist feels heard and action is taken. Um, one of the biggest shifts that really needs to happen in the industry as a whole, and I advocate for this in my research all the time, is getting rid of that multimedia journalist um, structure. And that is the solo journalist, some people call it a one man band, the journalist who goes out and does everything alone. I literally didn't have a photographer once my entire journalism career. I did everything by myself, including live shots. Um, and that means I have an earpiece in so I can't hear. I have lights in my face so oh I can't see. Goodness. And I'm paying attention to a camera and you are a sitting duck. Um, I'll never forget one time I was doing a story. There was a bear on Montana State University's campus. Walked right on campus. Um, <laughs> typical Montana moment. It was hungry, trying to calorie up for the, the winter. <laughs> so anyway, they tranquilize the bear. They move it off. End of a good day. I'm in front of Fish Wildlife and Park Building, and there's rustling in the bushes at 10 p.m. And I almost scream on camera. A dog ends up running out, but I was like, it's a bear. I'm about to be eaten. They're like, that's the best interactive stand up you can have. The reporter gets eaten by a bear. So, anyway, that's a small example. That's not harassment, but it just goes to show. You know, this one man band, this solo journalism is dangerous. And I have other stories I can share um, about this, but that's one of the bigger things I advocate for in my research. So it's really a practical implication. 
Okay, I have a question for you. That's that's not. It's kind of a segue. So, w- journalists tell other people's stories and share other experiences, right? So, as you conduct research and you're interviewing journalists, do you find that there's hesitation to share their own experiences? Do you have to kind of pull that out or is there like, thank you for talking to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, Mm -hmm. let's get this out. Yes. Oh, I love this. I'm so glad you asked that. (laughs) Yes. It's um, I I had a journalist tell me once we're the voice for the voiceless, but who's the voice for us? Because Ah, right. There is this, mentality in journalism that you tell other people's stories and you leave yourself out of it. And I think that's part of the reason that this topic has not gotten covered for so long because journalists don't talk about it. And then because they don't talk about it because they don't want to be the story, it gets normalized. Um, And it becomes just part of earning your chops, right? Uh, I had an article come out, the price you pay in the badge of honor. Women saw harassment as the price they pay for doing journalism as women and men saw it as a badge of honor. Um, And I can get into depth why they had very different views of it but both of them had normalized it as something that just happens um and so they struggle sometimes to tell me these stories because they don't want to be part of um the story right but i think research for them they see it as wow i finally get to say something and i have to date done all my research i conduct and provide um anonymity and so I, I want to say anonymity obviously it's just confidentiality because I know who they are personally mm-hmm. but um it allows them to speak up and um and not feel like they're going to get in trouble by their news organization because they're all under a lot of almost all print bro- almost all broadcast journalists excuse me are under a contract um and they have like NDAs and whatnot that are part of those contracts it's common and standard in the industry and so they worry about that and so wow. um they can kind of speak freely nothing identifying will be given and they finally get a vent um it was funny when I first started this like I don't know why you're, you're researching this this has been going on for years and I was like that's why I have to research it yeah. because no one's talking about it it's been going yeah. on for years um, and so I think many are excited to tell their stories. I think it also helps that I was a practicing journalist and yeah. I no longer have to sit there and just nod my head quietly um, like I did as a journalist. Now I can go, wow, something similar happened to me and we can really have this different kind of interaction because I'm not playing the role of a journalist interviewing you. I'm a researcher interviewing you. And that's been really helpful to build rapport with, with people. Well, it's interesting, um, Caitlin, because... I was a fellow photographer and former journalist eons ago, but these things that you're talking about in terms of the emotional side of it and the harassment, what I find fascinating about what you're doing is that you're actually kind of shining a light on what's happening to women in the field. And I feel like if you look at studies in a lot of Um, journalism journals and places like that from like let's just say the time I you know quit working professionally to the last few years you had all this information about demographics and the workplace and and things like that but it seemed as if we weren't academically kind of touching on what goes beyond what you do for the job you know the harassment piece and I and I feel like it's such a critical time to be shining a light on that so my question is and it sounds like you would have many 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 answers what would you say is one of your more surprising findings from one of your studies oh that's really that's a great question i think i had a a recent study where i really looked at the effects of harassment it it seems silly but in, in in research, you always have to answer, you know, so what, why does this matter? And I want to say that my research is self-evidently just the most important thing in the world, right? But you still have to argue (laughs) why it matters. And so I'm always looking at, well, what are the effects of harassment? Like, how does this impact not just the journalists individually, but the work they produce, right? Because that Mm -hmm. work is a cornerstone to democracy. That's how information gets out there and powers are held accountable. And so journalism matters. And what I found in my research is there was a startling number, like two in 10, roughly 20% of journalists, maybe higher if I can remember correctly, considered leaving journalism because of the harassment they experienced. Wow. 
Um, and that number is higher for women compared to men. Mm-hmm. That's startling, right? One in mm-hmm. five mm-hmm. considered mm-hmm. leaving because of harassment. And if we're seeing, okay, women, younger journalists and journalists of color are the ones being harassed the most, um, that's a that's a voice that's being pushed out of the industry. And that's a voice that really matters in an industry that has historically lagged behind um, in diversity compared to the nation averages. So I think that is what startled me the most and was perhaps the most um, frustrating finding that I had is look, everyone, this matters. People are leaving journalism yeah. um, and they're, they're surviving the low pay and the crazy hours, uh, but they're not surviving the abuse. Yeah. yeah. And I- I mean, I, I, given I want well, a couple. I, I, does that happen? That that consideration of leaving almost immediately once the journalist is being a professional journalist, or does that happen kind of later on? Have you looked into that? Most journalists, the percentage of journalists who considered leaving, it's higher for younger journalists. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, I, I remember when I told my boss, you know, I was leaving, I'm, I'm breaking contract and quitting. Um, she's like, but you know, you're one of our best journalists and I can't, I was like, I can't do it anymore. And she, she told me, she's like, it's not the best journalists who make it to the top. It's the ones who can hold out the longest. Um, and, and I, I've, I've thought about that a lot. It's the ones who can put up with the abuse or the harassment or whatever the longest who end up kind of building careers and going further. Cause sometimes the best journalists go, you know what, this abuse is too much or X, Y, and Z is too much. And, and I, I have to leave. And so it tends to affect younger journalists more, particularly women as well. Um, there's already a disparity. Women make up a larger percentage of journalism graduates, yet they don't make up a larger percentage of journalism professionals. Um, and they're also the ones being abused more so it so i think that what you said um is is about younger journalists leaving kind of more is also really important and connected and and interesting to the work that you're doing in the classroom i i could think like oh my gosh i went to school for four years to do this and and now i'm leaving because i didn't know that it was going to be like that and so i think that that's I've, I've heard of that in other, like teaching and nursing and now journalism and my goodness, what, what responsibility we have as educators. Yes. And it's something I have conversations with my friends and colleagues all the time about this, because in the beginning I had to settle some cognitive dissonance of like, wow, what am I doing? Is this ethical? And then eventually (laughs) I was like, yes, because journalism still matters Mm -hmm. and maybe I couldn't do it, but there are people out there who can, um, and I'm going to give them all the tools to make sure that they can be equipped and know what decision they're getting into when they enter the industry. Um, and I think having students who are empowered, who expect it, who know how to act, who have tools for combating abuse um, is the best that we can do. And I think we can make more journalists who um, know what they're getting into and are excited and stay in the industry longer because they're prepared. Mm. All right, Caitlin, so we are getting to the wrap-up section of this episode, but before we sign off, we want to make sure that we get a couple of recommendations for you. So, for example, what's your favorite TV show, or what are you watching right now? Oh, gosh, that's a hard one. I watch a lot of HGTV and Food Network. (laughs) I get stressed out by anything with a narrative arc in general. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, you know, I just finished some new episodes of Good Bones. Um, I might jump over to Guy's Grocery Games after this. Uh, That's about where I lie, though. And then at night, you know, I've rewatched Bob's Burgers about 10 times. So that's (laughs) always a good one. Um, If your life was a reality TV show. Um, Or if you wanted to be on a reality TV show, which one would that be? Oh, gosh. I I don't know. My house, I call it the, like, never-ending dog madhouse. Um, (laughs) Last fall, we had, at one point, like, five dogs and five cats because I just couldn't say no to fostering. Um, And it became problematic. So some sort of animal reality show that's not hoarders because I'm trying to get these animals out of hoarding situations. (laughs) But um, something like that. I like it. I, like I think it. you can just start your own reality show with dogs and cats. Yeah. Um, so what book is on your nightstand? 
Gosh. Um, well, I am rereading uh, Expecting Better by Emily Oster. She's a medical uh, economist um, and a professor, and she wrote a book on for pregnant women and how to go through research and make better informed decisions while pregnant. I'm almost four months pregnant. Um, and so that's something that's informing kind of my research uh, right now in my personal time because I can't stop reading research. So <laughs> yay! Uh, congratulations. Thank you. One of those problems of being a researcher, right? Yep. <laughs> all right. What movie do you, uh, we all need to see right now? Oh, I'm the worst person. I don't watch movies ever um, unless it's like Star Wars related. <laughs> um, I swear I've been to movie theaters like three times in the last decade and it was only for a Star Wars movie. So I don't know. I'm bad. I did watch the Bob's Burgers movie. Um, so that one's pretty good. Low stakes. Not a lot of stress for me. So that was good. <laughs> Okay, Love and if you had to commit to eating only one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? You know, on a normal day, I would probably say broccoli, but again, I'm what? almost four months pregnant, so it's probably like frozen pizza right now. <laughs> um, cheese and carbs are about my friend, so. <laughs> I'm surprised by the broccoli answer. That's a, that's a great answer. Yeah, I eat so I used to eat so much broccoli. And then one day broccoli and coffee, which were like my liquid and sustenance, um, (laughs) just don't sound good anymore. I miss them. So yeah. Well, cheese and carbs are always, always winners. Mm -hmm. Yes. Caitlin, it has been so wonderful catching up with you today. We want to thank you for your time. This has been so much fun. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been great. Thanks, Caitlin.